Time on the Cross, The Economics of American Negro Slavery by Robert William Fogel and Stanley L. Engerman. The, anat the Anatomy of Exploitation The point of issue here is not whether sexual exploitation of slave women by masters and overseers existed, but whether it was so frequent that it undermined or destroyed the black family. Let us pose the question somewhat more sharply. Are there reasons to believe that the degree of sexual exploitation which white men imposed on black women was greater than that imposed upon white women? We put the issue in this way because while the sexual exploitation of white women was rife, few have gone so far as to claim that such exploitation destroyed the family institution among whites. The asymmetry of the presumed effects of sexual exploitation on the families of blacks and whites justified by available evidence? Antebellum critics of slavery answered these questions in the affirmative. They accused slave owners and overseers of having turning plantations into personal harems. They assumed that because the law permitted slave owners to ravish black women, that the practice must have been extremely common. They also assumed that black women were, if not more licentious, at least more promiscuous than white women, and hence less likely to resist the sexual advances of men whether black or white. Moreover, the ravishing of black women by white men was not the only aspect of sexual exploitation which devastated the slave family. There was also the policy of deliberate slave breeding, under which planters encouraged promiscuous relationships among blacks. Thus, economic greed and lust on the part of the planters and submissiveness on the part of the slaves combined to make sexual exploitation of black women so extreme to, as to be beyond the comparison with the situation of white women. The evidence on which these assumptions and conclusions were based was extremely limited. While none of the various travelers through the South had seen deliberate slave breeding practice, they had all heard reports of it. Some travelers published conversations with men who admitted to fathering a large number of slaves on their plantations. Others wrote of a special solicitude shown by one or another master to a mulatto offspring, a solicitude which made their minds strongly implied uh, parenthood. There was also descriptions of the treatment of especially pretty slave women on the auction block and of high prices of which such women were sold, prices too high to be warranted by field labor, and which could be explained only by their value as concubines or as prostitutes. Even if all these reports were true, they consisted at most a few hundred cases. By themselves, such a small number of observations out of a population of millions could just easily be used as a proof of the infrequency of the sexual exploitation of black women as of its frequency. The real question is whether such cases were common events that were rarely reported or whether they are rare events which were frequently reported. The prevalence of mulattoes conceived not only the northern public of the antebellum area, but historians of today that for each case of exploitation identified there was thousands that had escaped discovery. For travelers to the south reported that a large proportion of slaves were not the deep black of the Africans from the Guinea coast, but tawny, golden, and white, or nearly white. Here was proof beyond denial, either of the ubiquity of the exploitation of black women by white men, or the pros promiscuity of black women, or of both. But the seemingly irrefutable evidence is far from conclusive. It was not the eyesight of the travelers of the South which is questionable, but their statistical sense. From the mulattoes were not distributed equally through the Negro population. They were concentrated, they are concentrated in cities and especially among freedmen. According to the 1860 census, 39% of freedmen in southern cities were mulattoes.
Among urban slaves, the proportion of mulattoes was 20%. In other words, one out of every four Negroes living in the southern city was a mulatto. But among rural slaves, who constituted 95% of the slave population, only 9.9% were mulatto in 1860. For the slave population as whole, therefore the proportion of mulattoes was just 10.4% in 1860 and 7.7% in 1850. Thus it appears that travelers to the south greatly exaggerated the extent of miscegenation because they came into contact with any unrepresentative samples of the Negro population. They appear to have had much more contact with the freedmen and the slaves of the urban areas than with the slaves living in the relative isolation of the countryside. Far from proving the exploitation of black women was ambiguous, the available data on mulattoes strongly mutilates, uh, militates against the, conten the, the contention. The fact that during 23 decades of contact between slaves and whites, which ex elapsed between 1620 and 1850, only 7.7% .7 of slaves were mulattoes suggests that on average, only a very small percentage of the slaves born in every, any given year were fathered by white man. This inference is not contradicted by the fact that the percentage of mulattoes increased by one-third during the last decade of the antebellum era rising from 7.7 to 10.4 percent, for it must be remembered that mulattoes were the progeny, not just of unions between whites and pure blacks, but the unions between mulattoes and blacks. Under common definition, a person with one-eighth ancestry of another race was a mulatto. Consequently, the offspring of two slaves, who were each one-eighth white, was to be classified as a mulatto, as was the offspring of any slave regardless of the ancestry of his or her mate whose grandfather was white. A demographic model of the slave population which is presented in the technical appendix shows that the census data on the mulattoes alone cannot sustain the contention that a large proportion of slave children must have been fathered by white men. And other available bodies of evidence such as the WPA survey of former slaves throw such claims into doubt. For those in the survey who identified patronage, only 4.5% indicated that one of their parents had been born white, but the work of geneticists on gene pools has revealed even the last figure may be too high. Measurements in the admixture of Caucasian and Negro genes among southern rural blacks today indicates the share of Negro children fathered by whites on slave plantations probably averaged between 1 and 2 percent. That these findings seem startling due to a large measure to the widespread assumption that because the law permitted ma masters to ravish their slave men women, they must have exercised that right. As one scholar recently put it, almost every white mother and white con connected with the institution of slavery either actually or potentially shared the males in their family with slave women. But the trouble with this view is that it recognizes no forces operating upon human behavior other than the force of statute law. Yet many rights permitted by legal statutes and judicial decisions are not widely exercised because economic and social forces militate against them. To put the issue somewhat differently, it has been presumed that masters and overseers must have ravished black women because, frequently because their demand for such sexual pleasures was so high and because the cost of satisfying that demand was low. Such arguments overlook the real and potentially large thoughts that confronted masters and their overseers who sought sexual pleasures in the slave quarters. The deduction of daughter or wife of a slave can undermine the discipline of planters so assuredly to strove, they strove to attain. Not only would it steer anger and discontent in the families affected, but it would undermine the air of mystery and, dis, and distinction on which so much of the authority of the large planters rested. Nor was it just a planter's reputation in the slave quarter's plantation that was at stake. While he might be able to prevent the news of his nocturnal adventure 
from being broadcast in his own house, it would have been more difficult to prevent his slaves from gossiping to slaves on other plantations. Owners of large plantations who desired illicit sex, sexual relationships, were by no means confined to slave quarters in their quest. Those who owned 50 or more slaves were very rich men by the standards of their day. The average annual net income in this class was in excess of $7,500. That amount was more than 60 times the per capita income in 1860. The have a comparable income today in 1975 dollars before tax income is about $600,000. So rich a man could easily have afforded to maintain a mistress in town where his relationship could have been not merely more discreet than in the crowded slave quarters of his own plantation, but far less likely to upset the labor discipline which economic success depended upon. For the overseer, the cost of sexual episodes in the slave quarter, once discovered, was often his job. Nor would he find it easy to obtain employment elsewhere as an overseer, since not many masters would be willing to employ as their manager a man who had known for his lack of self-control on such vital an issue. Never employ an overseer who will equalize himself with the Negro woman, wrote Charles Tate to his children. Besides the morality of it, there are evils too numerous to be now mentioned. 